Tina Koto Katoa, Namihi Nui Kiakoto Katoa. Good afternoon to you from Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. My name is Murray Bruges. I'm the director of the Helen Clark Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar exploring the current state of the war in Ukraine. Uh, a very warm welcome to our Helen Clark Foundation members. Our foundation is an evidence based, independent, and nonpartisan think tank, and we could not do what we do without your support. If you're not a member of our foundation and you enjoy this webinar, please do consider supporting our work by becoming a member at Helen Clark, that's all one word, dot foundation, uh, or you can also sign up to our free newsletters there. Uh, before we begin today's webinar, I'll touch on a couple of webinars we have pending over the next few weeks and months. Uh, next Wednesday at 12.30, we'll have a webinar on a major report our foundation launched uh, just this week on sponge cities. Uh, how New Zealand's urban areas can survive and thrive in the face of increasingly extreme rainfall events uh, caused by a warming climate. Uh, we also have webinars coming up on inequality in New Zealand, on global e economic trends uh, and the implications for New Zealand and on New Zealand's trade policy in the 21st century. Uh, please keep an eye out for these in your inboxes and if you're not on our email lists, please consider signing up for free at HelenClark.Foundation. For those of you who haven't joined many of our webinars before, it's worth noting that this is not a normal Zoom call. Uh, you're not on camera and you can't unmute, so there's no risk anyone can see or hear you eating your lunch. Uh, that said, we'd love for you to participate in this webinar, and the best way to do that is to submit questions uh, at any time they occur to you during the webinar by typing them into Zoom's Q&A function, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also vote for questions others have submitted uh, by clicking on the thumbs up button and more votes means a question is more likely to be asked. Uh, you'll also see there is a separate chat function. Um, I think Helen's already put some, some links in there, so keep an eye on that, but please put your questions into the Q&A area. Uh, today's webinar will uh, focus on the conflict in Ukraine 18 months after Russia's full-scale invasion in February last year. Uh, the format will see the Right Honourable Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand and former Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme, uh, interviewing our guest today, author and military strategist Mick Ryan. At around the 40 minute mark, we'll switch to a Q&A session, and at that point, I'll put the questions you've entered in the Q&A section to, to Mick. Uh, that's it for housekeeping today, uh, so I'll now introduce our guest. Uh, Mick Ryan spent 25 years in the Australian Army, including serving internationally um, in East Timor, in Indonesia, the United States, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Mick retired in 2022 as a Major General and has since released two books. His latest, just released in May this year, uh, White Sun War, is a fictional account of a future war in the Taiwan Strait. Mick was made a member of the Order of Australia uh, for his leadership of a reconstruction task force in Afghanistan. Uh, you may have seen Mick's thoughtful commentary on the war in Ukraine in The Economist and on Australian and American news networks. Mick, we're thrilled you could join us today and over to you, Helen. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, it's great to be with you. And good afternoon, everyone, and special uh, greetings to Mick, who's joining us from across the ditch, I think we can say, <laughs> Mick. Um, well, it's it's great that we're devoting this time again uh, with a foundation webinar to the the war in Ukraine and um, Mick Ryan has been a, a prominent commentator on the war, drawing on his own extensive uh, background as a major general, uh, retired in the Australian Army. Mick, I think uh, we have all seen so much of the coverage uh, of of the war, but it's really the you know the story behind the headlines that we're always uh, interested in. We know more about the geography of Ukraine than we ever uh, knew knew before, and uh, we watch uh, now this um, summer counteroffensive by Ukraine. Its broad front approaches it probes to see where there might be some uh, some gains to be to be made. Uh, but I think. Probably the best way into the, the webinar is to say to you, could you give us a helicopter view of the state of the conflict right now as we're into kind of probably late summer in Ukraine? I imagine by September, it's starting to get a little colder again. And of course, uh, by November, you're into very, very cold weather when uh, conflicts tend to uh, generally slow a little going into the winter. So let's start off with the with the helicopter view of, of where it's at. Sure. Thanks, Helen. It's a real honour to be invited to speak with you today. And, and I'm, I'm happy to talk and uh, 
It's uh, certainly cold here today down by the bay in Brisbane. It's down to about 25 degrees centigrade. So uh, thank, thanks. Uh, so the war in Ukraine at the moment, we are seeing the Ukrainians undertake uh, a wide variety of campaigns, whilst a lot of the attention is focused on the southern campaign that Ukraine is undertaking and the two key axes of advance. We're seeing a fairly significant offensive campaign being conducted by the Ukrainians around Bakhmut. They're having some success there. We're seeing a defensive campaign further north in Luhansk, where they have pretty much fought off a really significant Russian uh, attempted advance there, which has been no successful than their offensives early in the year. Uh, concurrently, the Ukrainians have an air defence campaign every night. There are missiles and drones launched against different parts of their country. We have seen that air defence campaign evolve throughout this war uh, to an air defence network that is the most sophisticated and effective anywhere in the world. And then, of course, we've seen this maritime campaign of attacks against Russian naval vessels, against the Russian naval base at Sebastopol, and even against the Kirsch Bridge. And then up top, of course, is their strategic influence campaign. The reason I outline all these campaigns is to kind of draw us away just from one campaign in the South, just to draw a picture of how complex modern warfare is and how difficult this undertaking is for Ukraine. There are very few countries in the world that could undertake this very difficult and complicated series of campaigns sequentially, let alone concurrently. Mm. Very complicated, as you say. And, and over the uh, winter months and leading up to the counteroffensive, clearly uh, the Russian forces had uh, quite a lot of months to uh, prepare defences. And so we we read about defences which look like the Hindenburg line on steroids, really, uh, heavily mined uh, major defences against tanks and so on. Uh, would you like to say a little bit about what the Ukrainians are, are running into and whether in the obviously long shopping lists of equipment they've uh, been seeking uh, from their, their supporters, uh, whether they've yet got sufficient of that landmine detection and destruction gear uh, to make the headway they'd like to. Mm. Well, uh, you know, uh, landmines and very deep defensive belts are nothing new, as you and the listeners know. I mean, mm. something very familiar to Australian and New Zealand soldiers in North Africa or New Zealand soldiers and their advance through Italy during the latter parts of the Second World War. So this isn't a new problem and they are not a new technology. The problem we have is that on top of this is now a, what I call a meshed sensor framework of, that uses both military and civilian satellite imagery and other sensors, which is then linked through digitised command and control to ensure that one, you will be seen if you're approaching these things, and two, you can brought under fire within about a minute or two. That is very different to the wars that our grandfathers fought in the Second World War and afterwards. Unfortunately, the tactics and the technologies have not changed since the Second World War. So there's a significant gap between reality and capability. And I think this reflects a intellectual failure on the part of the West. We had months to prepare for this. We saw what the Russians were doing, but we thought the same old approaches and the same old technologies would work. Uh, they're not working well, and the Ukrainians are having to adapt as they go. Mm. I've heard it said, uh, Mac, that Ukraine retaking Crimea is not fanciful. Would you like to offer a kind of strategic view on that? Well, I think Ukraine taking Crimea is actually essential. Uh, Crimea is part of Ukraine. Uh, most of the countries in the world recognise it as such. The United Nations certainly does. Um, and the Ukrainian government has basically said, we are going to take back 
all of our territory that was recognised as a sovereign state of Ukraine in 1991 when we gained our independence, including Crimea. Um, I think that should the Ukrainians be able to fight their way to the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea in this fighting season, it will make Crimea very difficult for the Russians to retain. It will make it untenable in some respects. And hopefully that will either force the Russians into an accommodation or, you know, be the foundation for the Ukrainians taking it back off the Russians in 2024 or 2025. Mm. Um, I think it's worth noting, this is not a war that's going to be over in the next 12 months. Um, and I think the West has generally fought the war three months or six months at a time, as we tried to do with Afghanistan for 20 years. Um, we need a better strategy that's focused on Ukraine winning, not surviving, and that is done over the long term, not over the short term. Mm. So this, quote, fighting season, as, as we could term it, is going to run through the rest of August, run through September, run through October, and then recalling that uh, Ukraine took Kherson uh, back, I think, in November last year. It's probably going to run to November as well. Mm. Any kind of, you know, bird's eye view of, of where things might stand by November? Well, certainly once you get into the rains at the end of the year and start of next year, as well as winter, um, you know, we didn't see operations stop, but they certainly slowed down. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is just climatic. Second, the Russians were exhausted by the end of last year and severely attrited. And third, a whole lot of equipment that the Ukrainians would have liked to continue operations didn't turn up. Mm. So I think there's some great lessons from the back half of this last year that we should be learning for this year. We need to be front-loading them with equipment and munitions now so they can continue fighting and keep the pressure on the Russians. I mean, the Russians are brittle at the moment. There's a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence in the South that they're running out of reserves. If the Ukrainians can keep the pressure on them for the next few months and then continue over winter, you know, the Russians could be in a very different position by the start of uh, you know spring next year. Mm. How much of a liability is Ukraine not having had the jet strike aircraft that it sought? Oh, it certainly had an impact. I mean, uh, as you know, there's no wonder weapon or silver bullet in any war. Uh, they, they all kind of uh, add up to each other uh, to provide advantage. But uh, the long and the short of it is that Ukraine's Air Force fighters have uh, radar range half of that of the Russians and missile range half of that of the Russians. That is not good for defending your airspace. Now, they've adapted to use ground-based air defence to keep the Russians out largely, but if they were to have Western fighter aircraft, it would level the playing field, as it were, to push Russian aircraft further away from Ukraine's borders. And that's important because it's these aircraft that launch long range missiles at Ukraine that they would like to push further away from their mm. territory. Mm. So if, as you just said, uh, Russia is showing you know, some signs of weariness in the South and this fighting has got, I would think three and a half months to go before uh, it, it gets much more difficult with the with the winter. Uh, is it anticipated that there'll be another large conscription mobilization in in Russia? And what sort of scale? It, it, I mean, while we know that President Putin isn't subject to a, you know, a lot of domestic pressure or pushback, nonetheless, um, the Moscow and St. Petersburg middle class for a start don't particularly like the kids called up as what we've observed. So where does this go? Yeah, I mean, the, the partial mobilisation announced by Putin last September was a response to a whole range of things, the Kherson Bridge attack and, and uh, sorry, Kersh Bridge attack and mm. the failures in both Kharkiv and Kherson. But it it was a response to them losing 100,000 soldiers last year. But what they've done since then is stepped up recruiting. Um, 
uh, to counter that, you know, they continue losing a lot of soldiers in Ukraine and um, Defence Minister Shoigu at the start of the year announced this expansion in the size of Russia's military. Um, it's going to be very difficult for them to kind of square the circle, as it might say, to sustain the number of troops they need in Ukraine whilst building the size of the Russian military and at the same time addressing the qualitative elements of a military. Having 100,000 new soldiers isn't actually a recipe for advantage on the battlefield. It can be an, a recipe for total mm. chaos. Mm. So it's going to take them years to rebuild their middle and higher ranks that they've lost a lot of in this war. Uh, are there reservists or actual garrisons and well-trained troops that are sitting in other parts of Russia, which can be brought across, or have they got most of what would be a professional force already there? Yeah, they've combed through their professional, uh, what might be known as elite units over the last 18 months. I mean, they are really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Um, and one of the reasons mobilisation was so problematic is all their professional troops were in Ukraine and they didn't have those professional troops to train mobilised soldiers. I mean, it'd be a bit like having a parliament that's made up entirely of first term, first year uh, members of parliament with one or two old hands. I mean, that's the kind of situation Russia's in at the moment. Mm. So th there's been obvious concern that this is a conflict which involves a nuclear armed state. And there has been loose talk, not least from former uh, President and Prime Minister Medvedev, uh, around the use of at least, quote, tactical nuclear weapons. And I think I'm also correct in saying that the um, intermediate range uh, nuclear missile uh, treaty, which uh, had prevailed between the United States and, uh, and Russia, has fallen into disarray. So how, how serious a threat is this? Is it idle musing of Medvedev and hardline uh, bloggers? Or is it, you know, something that has to be factored in that if they do quote, too badly, that remains an option? Well, when anyone, when any belligerent possesses nuclear weapons, you just can't discount it. I mean, the the impact of using these weapons is so appalling that you just can't discount it. Uh, Medvedev is cre clearly, uh, you know, bordering on being a psychopath. Uh, but Putin has clearly uh, leveraged his nuclear arsenal as part of shaping the decision making of NATO in the United States. Um, I mean, it's part of Russian doctrine to do that, to escalate, de-escalate when it comes to nuclear weapons. And I think he could probably rightly think he's been reasonably successful. There is no no-fly zone over Ukraine. There are no NATO troops on the ground. The US still uh, agonises over the kinds of capabilities it provides uh, so it doesn't escalate the war. But on the other hand... I think the US nuclear umbrella that's part of the NATO alliance has equally had a, a deterrent effect on Russia. It hasn't broadened this war beyond the bounds of Ukraine. Um, so I think uh, nuclear deterrence has actually worked both ways at this war. Um, and for Putin, the big question he has to ask if there was ever any consideration of the use of these weapons is, would it decisively change the trajectory of the war in Russia's favour? Um, I don't think anyone can say yesterday at the moment, which I think has been a very profound impact on why we haven't seen these things so far. And hopefully that will remain the case. Mm. So you said earlier, and I think this is clearly right, that the war is not going to be over in the next 12 months. Uh, and we, we will go into the into the winter with the lines wherever they sort of got to, as, as it were. And you said that the, the better strategy now for Ukraine's backers would be um, to have a strategy to win the war, not just to survive. That 
there's been a perception, I think, looking at the the NATO response to Ukraine's request that it it it's given them enough to get to where they are, but not yet uh, to to prevail. I mean, is is the judgment in Brussels that perhaps they can't prevail, or is the judgment that they could prevail, but basically it's 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 too big a lift for for NATO to to provide the equipment. We we do read, for example, that the reason President Biden gave for supplying cluster munitions, uh, you know, banned by by so many countries, was that everyone's running short of ammunition. So talk us through some of the calculations that are going on here. Yeah, I think, you know, Putin clearly has embraced a theory of victory, which is about outlasting the West. Mm. Uh, he assumes that we will grow tired of this war and move on. Um, even if that was to occur, I don't see the Ukrainians giving up anytime soon. You, you only have to go there to see that. But the you know the West and you know mainly the US and NATO need to embrace a strategy that undermines Putin's theory of victory uh, with one a long term approach to supporting Ukraine. It should also embrace victory for Ukraine, not survival for Ukraine, and they're two very different things. But it also needs to embrace things like stepping up industrial capacity in Europe standardization of the fleet of vehicles and aircraft that Ukraine uh, uses. And, you know, the EU and NATO membership uh, elements for Ukraine need to probably be put on even firmer foundation mm. uh, than what emerged from, from Vilnius and various EU meetings. So, you know, I think we need to undermine long war theory of victory. And that shouldn't be too hard. I mean, for goodness sake, we're in Afghanistan for 20 years and we had boots on the ground and Afghanistan was never as strategically important as Ukraine is. So, you know, I, I think like a lot of Putin's assumptions, we can prove him wrong, but we've just got to decide to do that. So his theory of victory now is what? Is it, um, is it a, a vision that actually still sees him you know moving in on all fronts including from belarus towards uh, kiev um retaking kharkiv taking the country or is it now a more limited quote vision of uh, consolidating the gains that he's made what does victory look like for him i think victory for him looks like what belarus looks like now a compliant mm. uh country that he may not run personally uh, but pretty much complies with uh, whatever he needs in a security or, or an economic or, or a diplomatic sense. That's what his in, end game looked like for Ukraine before this. I still think that's what it looks like. The means and, and the strategy for him to achieve that is through this long war to bleed out Ukraine and bleed out uh, Ukraine, especially European countries that are reaching the end of their tether when it comes to the quantities of equipment and munitions they're able to provide. Mm. So I was on a panel uh, in Europe uh, about a year and a bit ago with Professor Lawrence Friedman of King's College London, who's Professor of War Studies, and someone said, Lawrence, how do wars end? And Lawrence said, uh, they end either because somebody wins outright, uh, or they may end by negotiation, or they may not end at all. And, and in our region, uh, we are familiar with the armistice, which uh, created the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas, uh, which has just marked its 70th uh, anniversary. Uh, I guess the fourth option is the fighting just goes on and on and on. So if we're asked for your crystal ball gaze of how does this war end, of, of those scenarios, what what's looking feasible or likely at the moment? Well, I, you know, I still think Ukraine certainly has it in them to beat Russia on the field of battle. I mean, there's there's no doubt about that. They've done it before and they can do it again. Whether they'll do that or not is like all war. You just can't predict what's happening in, in the future. Um, 
and you know, if you have a look at a Ukrainian theory, the great tragedy of a Ukrainian victory is that Russia's still there. It's still big. It will be upset and aggressive. It just won't have the capability that it had otherwise. I mean, there is no scenario uh, where Russia becomes less of a danger at the end of this war. A beaten Russia is is a danger. A victorious Russia is an even bigger danger. And that's why countries like Poland are, you know, growing their military capability because they know even if Ukraine wins, Russia is still going to be a very dangerous neighbour. So unfortunately for Ukraine, who I want to win, and I want them to win the war and the peace here, uh, they're going to have to deal with an aggressive and dangerous Russia for a couple of generations to come. Mm. Mick, uh, talk us through what was happening at the the NATO summit, where, of course, Ukraine has been pressing for uh, membership and the door, while slightly ajar, hasn't, hasn't opened sufficiently for them to be able to join. And there was a bit of a flavour coming through the reporting that um, the attitude was, well, let's see where you are at the end of the, the summer um, yeah. and, we, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it again at some point. I mean, where is Ukraine left hanging at the moment? Well, certainly President Zelensky, just before the summit at Vilnius, uh, was clearly unhappy with where things stood. Uh, the communique from the summit certainly committed to Ukraine joining NATO at some point in the future, but the conditions under which that would occur were pretty unclear. And, you know, if I was a Ukrainian diplomat, uh, you know, their delegation that, that works with uh, NATO in Brussels or the defence minister, I'd kind of be scratching my head saying, so what are these conditions? What do we got to do? to get into NATO. I think they're still working their way through what those conditions might be. But I think the big condition that's unstated from NATO is, well, not quite now, it'll be some point, some point in the future, but we're not sure when. And, you know, that helps Russia, it doesn't help Ukraine. Hmm. So it's also the case that no one wants to negotiate while both sides think they can win. So does anything change that dynamic? It, it would seem to me that the US election is a rather important break point in the minds of, of uh, the president of Russia and, and those around him, uh, because noise is coming from the Republican camp that it would not be as supportive of Ukraine as, as President Biden and his administration have been. Uh, so that, uh, I imagine as a factor on Russia continuing to throw everything it's got at it until after the first Tuesday in November 2024. Does that seem like a huge sort of date to you as as to after which there could be some reassessment in Moscow if it's still in effect not making significant advances? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a couple of potential game changes here. That is certainly one. The US election year is going to have an impact on the war. I think, you know, Zelensky's trip to address Congress last year really was about understanding that, you know, I need support in this country beyond 2023, understanding that election years can be difficult uh, for the US as well as its allies and and security partners. Uh, I think so that's a significant black swan, but, you know, China's posture as well. You know, if China changed its tune and threw its support behind Russia more wholesomely than what it has already, that would be decisive. Um, Or if it support from Russia, that could be decisive. So I think, you know, there's probably a few white swan events out there that Mm. might have an impact on the trajectory of this war. Um, I think these peace conferences certainly have a use. I I don't think we should discount them as useful diplomatic opportunities to maintain some kind of dialogue. You absolutely need to do that. I mean, even the Nazis and the US had a dialogue through different interlocutors in the Second World War, and we need that in this war. You have to have dialogue. Uh, What it's going to result in, the Saudi one was useful, um, we'll see a few of these, uh, mm. but until we see some kind of decisive 
uh, event on the battlefield, I don't think we're going to see progress with peace negotiations. So what does China want out of this right now? Well, uh, I think what China wants, uh, firstly, is a US that's distracted. Uh, it wants to observe how the US and NATO make decisions about large scale conflicts. Mm. Uh, it wants to understand the limits of the US military industrial base and some of the technologies. I mean, pretty much everything Russia captures from the Ukrainians, you can guarantee will end up in a Chinese laboratory. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about that. I mean, uh, it's probably a condition of Chinese support and the Chinese will probably pay well for it. So these are the kind of things China wants, but it also is using it as an opportunity to say to many countries in Africa, in South Asia, in South America, say, yeah, see, this is what happens when you support countries uh, from Europe or America. You know, they just want you to be a colony. If you, if you kind of align with us, we'll never treat you like that um, and these kind of things. So, you know, China sees a lot of opportunity in this war and they're being pretty ruthless in exploiting it, I think. Hmm. And what about a word on what the war in Ukraine has done to and for NATO? President Macron had some pretty critical things to say about only four years ago when he pronounced his brain dead. <laughs> what, what, what's the verdict at the moment? Well, uh, you know, President Macron is a very eloquent speaker, um, and that certainly caused some ripples when he used that term. He, but he probably wasn't too far from the truth, to be quite frank. I mean, NATO, uh, after Afghanistan, really was searching around for a mission. I mean, military alliances, their strength is having an enemy to uh, join together against, and it lacked that. Uh, what Putin has done is reinvigorated NATO. In fact, it's expanded it to countries that all the way through the Cold War resisted joining NATO. So it's just one of many strategic failures out of this war. And, you know, at the uh, Madrid uh, get together last year, the Vilnius conference this year, we've seen a NATO that has re-looked at its founding principles, re-looked at its members, looked at its concept, now has a big war plan for Eastern Europe. None of this would have been possible, I don't think, if uh, Putin hadn't invaded Ukraine. Mm. We've got some terrific uh, questions coming in, you know, sort of probing on a whole lot of the issues we've raised. David Shand, for example, says, given this may be a long war, how resilient are Ukraine's manpower reserves compared to Russia? What might run out first, David asks? Yeah, well, I mean, at the, the end of the day, you don't need to conscript the entirety of your uh, 18 to 35-year-old population. You just need them available. I mean, Ukraine has built its military up to around a million people. Uh, the Russians have done something similar over the last year. Ukraine has an approach where it conserves its people, whereas Russia uses it, which both goes through manpower and is a disincentive for people to join. You know, I think over the next couple of years, both have the ability to sustain the numbers of people, but we're going to see an increasing supplementation of autonomous systems, not just in the air, but increasingly on the ground. Uh, not to complement humans, but to replace them in some sense as well. So I don't see any uh, prospect of Ukraine or Russia running out of people to fight in the next couple of years. I mean, Ukraine's 40 million people, Russia's 140. Uh, that isn't going to be a decisive element over the next year or two. Running out of shells, that could be decisive. Yeah, more likely than running out of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tim McCready asks, how might a Trump presidency 2.0 affect the Ukraine war? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, people who are better political experts than I am that are thinking and writing about this. And I think some of the recent stuff in The Economist on how people are preparing for a new Trump administration should 
well, it sends shivers up my spine and it should worry a lot of people. Um, you know, I, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's some evidence that Trump would be more aligned with uh, Russia than NATO in, in some respects. Um, whether he can pull that off after what Russia's done in this war is another question. But certainly there is a level of advocacy for reducing America's support for Ukraine. There's been about half a dozen polls recently. Most have indicated a majority of Americans want to keep supporting Ukraine, but the recent CNN one kind of was an outlier there. Um, you know, I, there will be lots of outcomes of a new Trump presidency that we will kind of find difficult to live with, and Ukraine will just be one of them. Mm. James Good asks, what could be the reasons for United States reluctance to provide long range precision weaponry such as ATACMs? UK has seen the importance of similar weapon systems with provision of storm shadow. Hmm. Yeah, the ATACMs is a, an effective long range missile that is fired from the HIMARS or multiple launch rocket system. Um, it is becoming more and more bewildering why they're saying no, given that uh, others have provided similar long range systems. I think now this is really about the number of ATACMs in inventory for uh, US contingencies in either the Indo Pacific or elsewhere. I think that's more the issue now. There were not a lot of ATACMs missiles built. Um, there are, you know, maybe a thousand or so, but that's not a lot when you're fighting this scale of war. Um, you know, uh, part of Australia's HIMARS uh, purchase includes some ATACMS missiles and other countries have ATACMS missiles. So I don't wonder whether uh, they might source them from other countries besides the United States. Mm. John Strang asks, um... Mick, as the result of this large conventional European war, are there impacts on the size and orbit for the Australian Defence Force and the New Zealand Defence Force? Well, I think inevitably there will be, even though Australia's recent Defence Strategic Review didn't mention Ukraine once, which was <laughs> mystifying. Um, inevitably, it will have an impact as much as we're resisting. Uh, you know, I think the Australian Department of Defence is resisting the lessons from Ukraine rather than studying them closely um, because, you know, it, it indicates a few areas where we haven't invested that really, really need significant uh, investment. Uh, the Japanese, on the other hand, have looked at it very closely. If you read their most recent white paper that came out about three weeks ago, it's very explicit of its learning in Ukraine. It's doubled the GDP going towards its defence. Um, they're taking the problem very seriously, um, whereas Australia's defence spending is pretty much flatlined. And with the impact of the $360 billion far future nuclear submarines, uh, defence spending is inevitably going to decline, unfortunately. Mm. Um, Gray Southern asks, this focus on military conflict is fascinating, but it is incredibly devastating for societies at all levels. Should we be questioning the capabilities of military to provide security? What happened to the prospects of negotiations, which Gray suggests have, quote, reportedly been suppressed in order to defeat Russia? What is the scope for negotiations now? Yeah, I mean, you might recall all the way up to the Russian invasion, there were negotiations that went on for months. I mean, this wasn't something where NATO said, let's go to war with Russia. It was where NATO was saying, we don't want this to happen. And there were any number of delegations that went to Russia to speak to a whole range of interlocutors to try and prevent this war. Um, this is not a war that was started by anyone other than the Russian government. Um, there were negotiations even in the early days of the war. Uh, but after Bushar and the Russian war crimes there, that politically became very difficult for the Ukrainians. And I think if you were to put yourself in the shoes of the Ukrainians, you would probably feel very much the same. So no one doesn't want negotiations. No one doesn't want peace, most of all the Ukrainians. Uh, but if you convince the Russians of that, please let me know any other method other than what the Ukrainians are doing now. Mm. 
Alex Anthony asks, why does Ukraine keep trying to attack the Kesh Bridge? Is this a purely military target or is it more of a symbolic target? Well, it, it has both political and military value. I mean, this was a bridge that was a vanity project by President Putin that was opened in 2018, 2019. So by striking the Kirsch Bridge, it's a personal attack on Putin. But it also sends a message to the Russian people saying, you know, military can't defend even a bridge. Uh, so there's a political uh, dimension here, but there's also a military dimension. It is a very significant high capacity road and rail link that is able to support the Russian forces that are occupying Crimea. So if you can reduce that, you can reduce supplies, but also force Russian supply lines to go through southern Ukraine where they can be more easily targeted by Ukrainian forces. So in short, there's both political and military imperatives for the Ukrainians to do this. And I think they'll continue doing it until they actually drop the bridge. Hmm. Natasha uh, Glue asks, the war on Ukraine has been so much in the public eye around the world. And so in the media, are there any concerns about how the war has been portrayed and reported on? Well, the, the truth of any war is that you only ever see a small part of it, even, even with the huge array of traditional and new media that are showing as imagery, uh, still photos, recordings, uh, maps from the war zone. You can see all that, but still be none the wiser about what is going on. Um, you know, very few people have experienced this kind of large scale war in their lifetimes. Fewer still have studied it deeply. Um, so what you are seeing on the TV is a very, very small part of the war. Um, and it won't be until after the war that we'll really understand everything that's going on. Seeing something and understanding something are two very different things, even in the information age. Mm. Uh, Melanie Pohl asks, what do we know about the Wagner mutiny? How why did it happen? And have there been any lasting effects on Russian military effectiveness? Now, we know there's a whole range of theories that have been put up about what was behind this, including the theory that it was all, um, I've even heard, worked through with Putin so he could see where the opposition to him really lay and some generals haven't been seen uh, since. Uh, but any any thoughts, uh, intel on this, Mick? Yeah, there are some magnificent theories out there about this. Um, the way I look at this is Putin probably believes in the old saying, every cloud has a silver lining. And I think that whilst this probably wasn't something he anticipated or drove, he is using it to his advantage now, which is why he's stayed in power for 20 years, to do a bit of cleaning cleaning out the house, which is why I think Prigozhin's still alive. I think Putin's seen some advantages in this, so he sees some advantage in keeping Prigozhin around, although he'd probably be under tighter control before. For us, it's, it's not a bad thing, because what it means is senior Russian commanders in Ukraine have to look in front of them as well as over their shoulder. And having a senior military leader distracted by what's going on politically behind him is a good thing for us. And there's some evidence that it is having an impact on, you know, middle and high levels of Russian officers uh, in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, Ruth Bonita says, it's dismaying to hear acceptance that the war will continue for at least another 12 months. Surely the only way forward is a negotiated peace, which would mean Russia withdraws troops from Ukraine and the US agrees not to enlarge NATO to include Ukraine. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, some may think it's dismaying. I, I find it repulsive. I mean, every day this war goes on, uh, more Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian people die. And I, I find that unacceptable in the current era. Uh, but I'll go back to... This wasn't started by Ukraine, NATO or anyone. This was started by Russia. They are not going to give up. They've made that very clear. And the only choice NATO and Ukraine have is to stop what Russia is doing. I mean, this is not some enlightened Russian 
uh, scout jamboree where they're bringing Russian culture and governance to Ukraine. This is an invading force that's set up dozens of torture chambers all through the country that all had the same fit out, including the same electrocution machines. They have deported hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, including thousands of children for which Putin has been indicted as a war criminal. I mean, I look at that and go, well, do you resist that or not? And as appalling as it is, the better choice is to resist it because not resisting it is even worse. Mm. Mara Williamson asks, do you think this conflict could have been avoided had the West taken a stronger position in enforcing its self-imposed red lines in Syria? A lot of the images of Ukraine look like what Russia did to Syria and the tactics seem to have parallels. Well, I think there's something in that. I mean, if you have a look at what Putin has done over the 20 years he's been president, you had the second Chechnya, you had the invasion of Georgia, you had Syria, uh, you had 2014 in Ukraine. And each time the West has kind of shaken finger at him, some small sanctions, none of which terribly deterred him. And I think going into this war, he felt something similar would happen again, that the West would not decisively intervene uh, and that the Ukrainian government and military performance would be the same as 2014. He's learned from previous experience and his assumptions about this war were shaped by the kind of experiences you just mentioned. Mm. Tom, Tony Clark asks, how is morale, morale in Ukraine? This must really take its toll and I'm interested to know how Russian citizens view this now. Have they started to doubt? Well, I think on the Russian side, I mean, all the polling suggests that there's a significant proportion of the Russian population that are behind the Russian military and Putin. Um, and there's no pathway to success where we see a Russian revolution overthrowing Putin. I just don't see that as a, a valid prospect. On the Ukrainian side, I mean, Morale is a very difficult thing to judge. You know, uh, people say, oh, well, they're not happy, so morale must be bad. It's like, no, happiness and morale are two very different things. You can be upset but have good morale in your institution. I mean, the Ukrainians have a grim determination to not be subjugated by the Russians. Um, and, you know, there are a few Ukrainians now that don't have a member of the family that hasn't been affected either being dehoused, uh, being wounded on the battlefield or being subject to Russian attacks. They see firsthand what this war involves. And, you know, uh, you know, there's a, I would call it a grim determination uh, where morale waxes and wanes, but they, they know what they've got to do. Um, and they're pushing on with it, whether the West supports them or not. Jill Kelly asked, how critical is leadership stability? for Ukraine and for Russia? Well, it's a pretty good question because I think there's been a real asymmetry in the quality of leadership uh, between the two. I mean, Putin is Putin. Uh, I think Zelensky has kind of been the leader of the hour um, right from the get-go, even though he'd been pretty well written off, not just by many leaders in the West, but by 70% of his own population in polling a couple of months before the war. So uh, good leadership matters at every level. And I think the stability of, you know, that leadership team of Zelensky, of his defence minister, Reznikov, his commander in chief, Zeluzhny, uh, his foreign minister and a couple of others, has meant they don't have to relearn the same old lessons over and over. So I think that stability is important. Now, clearly, with presidential elections coming up, there will be some uh, perturbations in, in the system, but I, I do think that stability has been an important part of how Ukraine has not only waged this war, but built alliances and gained support from the West, whether it's military, economic, diplomatic, uh, humanitarian. Alex White Robinson asks, is there a realistic risk of additional conventional escalation from Russia or is it already achieving as much as it can in this invasion? If they are fairly spent, what would be the reasoning for Ukraine's allies not committing more resources to hasten the liberation of Ukrainian territory? 
Well, certainly on the ground, you know, they're probably at maximum potential at the moment without a very significant expansion in numbers and industrial capacity, and that takes time. I think uh, in the air, they probably still have potential there. I mean, they have a very large air force, uh, much larger than Ukraine's. And from a maritime perspective, there's only so many ships you can fit into the the Black Sea. So, you know, there's still some military potential there Mm -hmm. in the conventional sense. Um, But, you know, the the Russians have been very poor at using that military potential. But importantly, I think they've been poor at aligning military objectives with the use of their military. I mean, at the end of the day, that civil military interaction is a critical thing to get right. And I don't know the Russians have really cracked that in the last 18 months, whereas I think the Ukrainians have probably been better uh, in that sphere of national endeavour. Got a couple of questions here, um, which I'll I'll take together. Michael Kutanch asked, what would be the result of if Ukraine was allowed to join NATO? And Andrew Riddell said, won't Russia see Ukraine as a member of NATO as a serious provocation, meaning that Russia will want to keep fighting and even escalate? Well, I, you know, I don't know if there's anything else we could do that's more of a provocation to to Russia than what they're already doing. When you have cities destroyed, 10% of your population displaced, you know, uh, under nightly aerial attack and having thousands of people killed on the battlefield, I, I don't know if there's anything more Ukraine can do to make Russia more angry. Um, so I wouldn't be too concerned about provoking Russia further unless provoking them is the same as defending our values. Um, You know, when it comes to NATO, I I don't know there's any prospect of Ukraine getting into NATO in the short term, uh, because it would, uh, at least under the North Atlantic Atlantic Treaty, which is a political uh, arrangement, not a military one, you're obligated to support those who are under attack. And it would force on many European governments a very profound decision on what they did to support a new NATO ally. Um, So I don't see them being members of NATO yet because I think most polities uh, prefer to remain in the early 2000s, slow war, counterinsurgency, low uh, casualty kind of environment uh, rather than the current era, which is faster pace, larger scale, higher casualty. No one has any appetite for that at the moment, I don't think. Simon Ewing Jarvi says, however the war uh, finally ends, there will be a separation zone. And I just flip down here. Um, uh, A separation zone, mine clearance and stabilization operations. What size force is likely? Now, of course, if the war ended with Ukraine back at its borders as they're internationally uh, understood, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean a separation zone. But but if and when it does end, clearly mine clearance and stabilisation become huge. Any thoughts, um, Mick, on the scale of that task? I mean, there is certainly potential for some kind of demilitarised zone. I don't believe any country is going to offer up troops to man that. I mean, I mean, it would just be such a dangerous undertaking that I think most countries would rather do benign peacekeeping operations elsewhere other than in a uh, active war zone. So I don't see a stabilisation force being um, realistic in this scenario. I do see demining operations as a very significant undertaking. About 15% of Ukraine is contaminated with either landmines or unexplosive ordnance or other remnants of war. Um, you know, at the end of the day, France is still clearing remnants of war from, you know, 100 years ago. We are still doing clearance operations in the Solomon Islands from you know, 80 years ago. This is a major task to ensure uh, Ukrainians are safe, that they're not stepping on landmines or getting blown up by these things, and that they can use their arable land to once again become the breadbasket of the world. 
So that's a very significant undertaking and something that we should be supporting them with now. It starts now. It doesn't start at the end of the war. The other one is reconstruction. I mean, the World Bank's recent estimates are somewhere around $750 billion. That's real dollars, not Australian dollars, but US dollars. Um, Australians, once again, they said reconstruction has to start now. We've got people without houses now. And if you walk the streets of somewhere like Bushar, like I have, they've already started rebuilding. They've rebuilt these areas. Um, so, you know, reconstruction and clearing remnants of war will be massive undertaking, but so will be societal reintegration. I mean, you have soldiers to reintegrate, you have re returning displaced people to reintegrate, and you're going to have collaborators that are going to have to be dealt with. So, you know, this uh, winning the peace is going to be a very significant generational undertaking for the Ukrainian people. Mm. I think I'll give the last question to Suzanne Sullivan, who says, was there a point in the past where the current war by President Putin could have been predicted? Was there a moment or a period where the West or Ukraine missed an indication that President Putin was going to commit himself to this major endeavor, brackets, before Crimea? Oh, I, you know, I, I think so. Um, you know, one of the great weaknesses of democracies is we we generally miss these kind of signals because we do mirror imaging. We kind of project our the way we think onto others. And you know, when you're dealing with someone like Putin or Xi, they don't think like us. They have a different strategic calculus. Um, so we we tend to assume that they're rational actors, and there's no way they'd want to see hundreds of thousands of their own people killed in a war. Well, some people don't think like that, unfortunately, as we've seen through our own history in the last hundred years. Every now and then, someone pops up who doesn't care for human life, who wants what others have, and you either stand up and resist it or you don't. The Ukrainians have taken a stand and they're worthy of our support. Mm. Well, Mick, it's been absolutely fascinating uh, talking to you and we, we really appreciate your, you know, your down-to-earth and a matter of fact um, analysis of this it is a depressing situation uh, who would have thought in our lifetimes we would see a major land war like this in in europe with people you know dying in trench warfare the way we saw our you know our forebears anzacs dying in on, on the somme at, the, at passchendaele and gallipoli and so many other tragic and horrific theaters uh, so it's it's good though to have a you know really realistic appraisal as I think you've given us of where things stand at the moment and I, I guess we'd we'd love to call on you again when a bit more water's gone under the bridge as it as it were and we we see th where things lie but I really can't uh, can't thank you enough and uh, really appreciate the, you, you spending time with us uh, Murray I'm going to bring you back in. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Thank you, Mick. Thank you, Mick, and thank you, Helen. Um, that's the conclusion of today's webinar. We hope to see many of you back for about the same time next week for a webinar on Sponge Cities. That's 12.30 next, uh, next Wednesday, New Zealand time. Uh, thank you all very much, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, and thanks again to Mick. <laughs>